uh, uh, yeah, uh, could you go back to uh, the slide before? Okay, so it's, it's a quick uh, protocol for uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, so uh, this is a webinar. Uh, you are in the room with all the participants. All right, uh, I would like to remind that we have uh, the version uh, of uh, whether you want to enjoy the lecture in English or in Indonesian. Uh, if you want to hear directly to professor, all right, you can select English, but we have Ibu Inawati Tedi MTH uh, to translate. If, if you prefer to listen to the lecture in Indonesian, please select uh, the uh, interpretation, all right? And then uh, you may raise your questions even during the lectures, all right, on the Q&A uh, button there, all right? So not in the chat, but in the Q&A. So, uh, and then during the Q&A session, uh, uh, I will read or I will give the, your questions to professor. Okay, next slide, please. All right, one more time, I would say uh, it's an honor for me to introduce our uh, speaker for this evening, Professor Richard Bolcom, PhD, FBA, FRSE. He was for many years a uh, professor of New Testament studies in the University of St. Andrews, Scotland, UK. He now lives in Cambridge, England, where he does his research and writing. He is known for many, many of his books, which include Jesus, the Eyewitnesses, the famous one, the theology of the Book of Revelation, and Jesus a very short introduction. He is a fellow of the British Academy. If you want to know about Professor, please uh, visit his uh, website there that uh, we provide, www.richardbaucom.co.uk. So uh, uh, Renato, I would like to uh, you to put uh, Professor Richard Baucom to the screen with me so we can have uh, discussion. Could you end your slideshow? All right. Okay. Okay. Could you? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon to you, Professor Richard Bokum. Good afternoon. Very good. Uh, it's, it's it's an honor for us to uh, having you here now to uh, give your lecture about uh, with the subject "Who is God?" Yeah, the key moments of the God's revelation in the Bible. And today we're gonna to talk about the, the uh, divine name, yeah. The revelation of the divine name. So how are you today, sir? Is it cold in, 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 in Newnham? Because... Uh, it's very cold actually, yes. Yes, very cold weather at the moment, early December, very cold. All right, I can... um, Excuse me, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to share my screen and yep. having a problem with it. Have I done it? Not yet. No. Um, yep, it's coming. Oh, no, not, not this one. This is the text. Uh, could you? Uh, yes. Your, uh, I'm your sorry. I'm, I'm... <sighs> um... No worries. Uh, we are waiting for you. No worries. Take your time. Yep. Yep. This one. Could oh. you could you enlarge and put it on the slideshow? Uh, slideshow. Yeah. Play from start. There. So right. Uh, play from start, please. So it, yeah, yeah, yeah. All righty. Okay, Professor, the 50 minute of the lecture is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlo. Um, hello to everybody all over Indonesia. I'm very glad to be, to be with you virtually at least uh, this evening. To begin, I just want to make an introduction to the whole series of, of three lectures that I'm giving with the title, Who is God? 
many people are asking the question, does God exist or is there a God? One can certainly discuss that question at length, but it does not seem to me to make too much sense unless one also asks the question, who is God? The content that people give to the word God has varied and does vary enormously. And so one has to ask, what kind of God are you actually talking about? What God? Or who is God? In biblical times, this was an obvious question. This was, this was the obvious question. Very few people thought there was nothing to which one could apply the term God or gods or the divine. But which God? Which of the many purported gods is truly God? Who is the God you, would talk, you are talking about? This was the key question, and I think still is. Even though all notions of the divine do have something in common, as Christians, we would want to give priority to those key events and experiences that the Bible relates and expounds as the revelation of God. We can answer the question, who is God, only by attending to who God has revealed himself to be. Of course, we could take the whole Bible as revelation of God. But within the whole story that the Bible tells, there are some key moments of revelation that, as it were, define who God is for us. Or it would be better to say moments in which God defines who God is for us. These are not merely moments that are narrated once within the biblical story. They are more like reference points to which the rest of scripture constantly refers back. They are moments that reverberate through the whole story. Moreover, like all events of great significance, their significance, their significance is not grasped once and forever. They are moments whose meaning is never exhausted. The key moments we shall reflect on in these lectures are not the only such moments. In a longer series, I could include others. But the ones we, should, we shall consider are undoubtedly among the most significant. And we begin today with what has been called the revelation of revelations, God's revelation of his name to Moses at the burning bush on Mount Sinai. But uh, before looking at the narrative in Exodus 3, I need to explain something about the divine name and how I refer to it. I follow the old Jewish practice of not pronouncing the name. Jesus and the first Christians and the New Testament writers all follow that practice, and so I think we should do so too. In fact, we can't be entirely sure how the name was pronounced. In the Hebrew Bible, where it occurs more than 6,800 times, it consists of four Hebrew letters, Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. And as you may know, vowels were not written in ancient Hebrew. The, the, name, is some, suddenly, so the name is sometimes known as the Tetragrammaton, which means four letters. Because the Jewish people came to think that the name should not be pronounced, substitutes for it developed. The usual one, which Jews would use when reading scripture and still do today, is the word Adonai, meaning Lord. Most English tra translations of the Old Testament <clears throat> follow the Jewish practice and represent the divine name it, by the English words, the Lord, but they put the word Lord in uppercase letters so that we can tell that in such cases, it is functioning as a substitute for the divine name. I shall return a little later to the question of substitutes for the divine name. 
So let's turn to the account of the revelation of the name in Exodus 3. I'm sure you know the story. But I want us to look in some detail at parts of the text. You'll remember, I expect, this is about Moses before the Exodus. Moses has had to get away from Egypt and he has become a shepherd looking after the flocks of his father-in-law in Midian. And Exodus chapter three starts like this. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that, he had turned aside to see. God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. In comparison with all the many other encounters with God that the Old Testament relates, this one has some remarkable features. It's the angel of the Lord who appears to Moses, but that is not unusual. Frequently in the early books of the Bible, when the figure of the angel of the Lord appears, this angel is not just a messenger of God, but virtually the presence of God himself on earth. The angel's presence is God's presence and what the angel says, God says. But how he appears in this case is remarkable. He appears in a flame of fire in a bush. The bush is blazing. It looks as though it's on fire. But the fire does not consume it. We'll come back to the meaning of this form of appearance. But notice for the moment that there is nothing at all like it in the rest of the Bible. This is a unique form of theophany. Then Moses is told to remove his sandals because the ground is holy, holy, no doubt, because of the presence of God. One striking thing about this is that if one were reading through the Bible from the beginning, this is the first time one would encounter the word holy. The word holy does not appear in Genesis, but starting here, it occurs frequently in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the rest of the Pentateuch. This is an indication, perhaps, that God's special relationship with his people, his holy people, made holy by his presence among them, begins here. The point is reinforced by the way that Moses is required to acknowledge God's presence. On only one other, other occasion in the Bible is someone told to remove their shoes because the ground is holy. That's when the commander of the heavenly army appears to Joshua. Probably people did go barefoot when they entered the tabernacle or the temple. But we are never actually told that in the Old Testament. It was a common custom in the ancient world and uh, still, still practiced, of course, by Muslims who take off their shoes when they enter a mosque. It's probably just taken for granted in the biblical accounts of the temple. 
But here in Exodus 3, the angel of the Lord tells Moses to remove his sandals because the ground is holy. Here begins, as it were, the story of God's holy presence with his people. And finally, in this passage, notice how God introduces himself. He is the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He had not appeared to the patriarchs in this way, in a burning bush, but he is the same God who called Abraham and made his still unfulfilled promises to the ancestors of the people of Israel. And he goes on to tell Moses, I'll just summarize the text here, he goes on to tell Moses that he has observed the miserable circumstances of the people of Israel in Egypt, and he has heard their prayers imploring his help. The people and Moses himself might well have supposed that the God of their fathers had forgotten them, disowned them. But no, he intends to free the people from Egypt and to give them the land of Canaan. And Moses is to be his angel, his, his agent. But Moses protests. He says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses <coughs> is not satisfied. He said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Why should the Israelites need to know the name of their ancestors God? Isn't it enough to know that he is the God of their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? They live in a world in which gods have names. All around them in Egypt live people who invoke the Egyptian gods, Ra, Osiris, Isis, Horus, Set and so on. To call on one of those gods for favour, one had to distinguish one from another by their names. Gods were no use unless one could call on them by name. There may even have been the sense that to know a god's name was to have some power to make the god respond. So if the god who sent Moses was really going to help them, they needed a name to use to call on, on him. So Moses asks what name he can give them. And God's answer to this answers, several answers to this question, are what we are most interested in in this lecture. And God actually answers Moses three times or in three stages. God said to Moses, I will be who I will be. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I will be has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my appellation for all generations. Go and assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, of Isaac and of Jacob, has appeared to me saying, I have given heed to you and to what has been done to you in Egypt. The writer has set out God's answer in three carefully marked stages. God said, he said further, he also said. 
the three distinct introductions to God's word distinguish three stages in God's answer that are evidently to be carefully distinguished and give a certain solemnity to the account. Each of the three stages should be taken seriously in its own right. And we may notice that it's only at the third stage that God actually gives Moses what he asked for, a name. God's first answer to Moses certainly does not give a name. On the contrary, it looks very much like a refusal to give a name. Uh, you can see here the three Hebrew words. Asher, uh, sorry, Ehyeh, Asher, Ehyeh. Now what exactly is meant has been much debated, partly because the Hebrew verbs can have either a present or a future meaning. So it could be, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. Most of the English translations go for I am who I am, which is probably how the words have most often been understood in the past. But it seems to me that the majority of scholars now favor the future meaning, I will be who I will be. And one reason for that is that the context is about what God is going to do. He's going to send Moses and deliver the people. And in fact, God has already, in his answer to Moses' first question, used the word ehye with future meaning. I will be with you, he said in verse 12. Secondly, parallels to the particular ling linguistic construction here suggest an idiom that has future reference. For example, in Exodus 16, 23, God tells the Israelites what to do with the manna. And he says, literally, bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. It means bake as much as you want to bake and boil as much as you want to boil. Or in Ezekiel 12, 25, God says, I will speak the word that I will speak and it will be fulfilled. It means something like, I will say whatever I choose to say or whatever I decide to say. The idiom is about having and making a free choice. So God here says to Moses, I will be whoever I choose to be. I will be whoever I choose to be. I am free to be who I choose to be. In more technical language, we might say that God is utterly self-determining. He can't be constrained by anything other than himself. He can say who he is and who he will be only by reference to himself, not by reference to anything else. He is who he chooses to be. Now, another reason I'm convinced of this interpretation is that it coheres with the symbolism of the burning bush. The fire blazes, but it doesn't consume the bush. Any other fire burns stuff up because it feeds on what it consumes. It can only continue to blaze while there is stuff it can consume then it goes out. But the fire in the bush is self-sustaining. It doesn't need fuel. It blazes as it chooses. So God is self-sufficient, self-subsistent and self-determining. He will be who he chooses to be. So it sounds as though God is refusing to be named. A name would tie him down. It would put him at the beck and call of anyone who knows his name. Names define and limit and constrain. And that's why the Israelites want to know, if, if that's why the Israelites want to know their God's name, 
so that they can call him to their aid like some genie in a lamp, then he will not be named. But notice God has in fact in this narrative already told Moses something about what he will be. I will be with you, he said in verse 12. So God in his free self-determination can and does commit himself, gives promises that he will keep. The point is that God commits himself. This explains how God then moves on to the second stage of his answer to Moses. Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I will be has sent me to you. What he does here is to summarise his self-declaration and condense it into one word, condenses the Hebrew three words into one word, ehye. And he uses that one word utterly ungrammatically as though it were a name. Moses is to say, I will be, has sent me. It means that the one who cannot be constrained, even by Israel's cries for help, commits himself to a course of action for Israel's sake. The self-determining one determines himself to be Israel's saviour. The one who is sending Moses to deliver the people. By using the statement of his freedom to be who he chooses in the way he does here, making it, making it function like a name in a statement of commitment, God declares himself to be the God himself, he himself has chosen to be in his grace and his love to be Israel's God, dedicated to Israel's good. This is a name that expresses his loving commitment to Israel, but which cannot be used to constrain or to control him. But only now <clears throat> in the third stage of God's answer to Moses, does God give himself a real name? Thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Now, if you look again at the Hebrew, you'll see that the name at the bottom of the slide looks and sounds like the verb ehye. I am or I will be. Three of the four letters of the name are the consonants in the word ehye. And so it looks as though it ought to be another form of the verb to be. And some scholars do argue that it is. The name means he is or he will be. Although this form is not actually attested in, a, in any ancient Hebrew that we know. Well, this is conjectural, and I want to stress that it's conjectural. We do not really know what the divine name means, if it means anything in the ordinary sense. What seems much clearer, I think, is that there is a play on words between Ehye and the divine name. Often in the Bible, when a personal name in it is explained, a child is born and his mother calls him so-and-so because, and there's an explanation. But often what we get there is not a true etymology, but a play on words. The name is explained by a word that sounds rather like it. So it doesn't really matter whether the name of God actually derives from the verb to be. What matters is that God first uses I will be as though it were a name and then associates his personal name with that usage by a play on words. 
So the two stages of God's answer to Moses that precede the giving of his actual personal name make it clear that what is expressed in the giving of the name is this. It does not negate God's self-determination. It does not reduce him to being Israel's God, a God who serves Israel's purposes, a tribal demigod. But it does mean that in his grace, in the freedom of his love, God has committed himself to Israel, chosen to be Israel's God, and done so irrevocably. So words in bold there, this is my name forever, and this is my appellation for all generations. Giving himself a name means the people of Israel can call him by name. Not that they control him, but that they can address him, appeal to his love and his loyalty. The name creates a relationship to which he will be, in which he will be their God, and they will be his people. So although the name is given specifically at this juncture of history, where God commits himself to the Exodus, to becoming known as, as, as the one who brought Israel out of Egypt, the name also looks forward to all the consequent history of Israel's relationship uh, with this God, Israel's God. This is by the Jewish art, art, art artist Mark Chagall. Now, I don't have the time now to say much about the use of the divine name in the rest of the Old Testament. It occurs more than 6,800 times in the Hebrew Bible and has been plausibly said to constitute the centre of Old Testament theology. The importance of the name does not lie in its meaning. Rather, its importance is that it stands for the identity of the God who bears it. This is what personal names do. They identify someone and point to all that we know about that person. They sum up who a person is as far as we know that. In God's case, all that God is cannot be known to finite creatures like ourselves. God remains the infinite mystery that we cannot sum up or pin down. But we can know the particular identity that God has given himself within the world so that people may know and relate to him. His name names that identity. The revelation of the name is a supreme act of God's grace, making himself accessible and knowable making himself Israel's God. But is it therefore, we might ask, a name that is only for Israel's use? Christians have often thought that. But at this point, we need to remember that God did, make, God did not make himself Israel's God <coughs> for the sake of Israel alone. God became Israel's God in order thereby to make himself the God of all nations. Especially in the prophets of the Old Testament, we find the expectation growing that in a great future act of salvation for his people, God will, so to speak, demonstrate his deity so that his people will know that he is the Lord and so that also all the nations will recognize Israel's God as the one and only God, and worship him themselves. The prophet, the prophet Zechariah puts it like this. Um, sorry, wrong slide.
I'm sorry, a slide has gone missing. What Zechariah says is this, and the Lord will become king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. The Lord will be one and his name one. And Zechariah goes on to describe the nations going up to Jerusalem to worship the Lord there in his temple. Now that rather arresting claim, the Lord will be one and his name one, is an echo of Israel's confession of faith, the Shema, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Israel believed that their God was the one and only true God, creator of the world, rightful ruler of the nations. When Zechariah says that the Lord will become one, he means that all will acknowledge that Israel's God, the Lord, is the one and only God of all the earth. But notice carefully that he also says that the Lord's name will be one. The nations will not continue to use the many different names of their gods. They will know God by the one personal name that identifies him as Israel's God, and as also, therefore, the God of all nations. Now, if as Christians we believe that these promises were fulfilled and are being fulfilled through Jesus Christ, then we might expect the New Testament to refer to the personal name of God. The New Testament writers make it abundantly clear that the God of Jesus, the God of Christian faith, of Jewish and Gentile believers alike, is Israel's God, the God who revealed his name to Israel, not a new God, but the same God who spoke to Moses. So we have to ask, what becomes of the name in the New Testament? Before answering that question, I need to expand a little more on what I said at the beginning of the lecture about that Jewish practice of not pronouncing the name. Since I said the practice was followed by Jesus and the apostles and by all the New Testament writers. By the time of Jesus, most Jews seem to have come to believe that the name should not be pronounced, except in the temple once a year, at least by the high priest. We do not know for sure when and why that idea became dominant that the divine name should not normally be spoken. There are some indications already within the Old Testament that the practice of avoiding speaking the name, if not always, at least for the most part, was already affecting the composition of some Old Testament writings. The most plausible explanation is that the third commandment, the third of the Ten Commandments, had a strong influence. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Now, no doubt the commandment especially forbids the careless or dishonest use of oaths spoken in the name of God. But it could also be used to, 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 to oppose the use of the name in magic, where all sorts of divine names were treated as having magical power. And simply in profane ways that showed no reverence for the God whose name it was. So keeping the name secret protected it from such abuses. And once the practice of not speaking the name was common, it would have become a way of generally expressing reverence for God. His name was holy. But only the high priest within the holy confines of the sanctuary, his own holiness carefully ensured, was sufficiently holy to speak the holy name. However, we need to know, no, notice carefully that while Jews in the time of Jesus generally did not speak the name, they frequently referred to it. When the scriptures, where the name, of course, 
frequently, constantly appears, they made use of the recognized substitutes for the name. Oh, yeah, there we are. Most often, these seem to have been in Hebrew, Adonai, and in Greek, Kurios. Uh, both words mean Lord, but they're not translations of the name, as people sometimes say. They're substitutes for the name. They signalled to the reader and the hearers alike that the tetragrammaton, the holy name, occurred there in the text. And these substitutes were not only used when reading scripture, they were also used by authors writing Jewish literature. And when Jews prayed, they most commonly addressed God as Lord. Not just as we might think alluding to God's Lordship, speaking as a servant to his Lord, but also referring reverently to the divine name. Without actually speaking the name, Jews continued what the Old Testament calls calling on the name of the Lord, calling him by the name he had given precisely to enable this relationship with his people. So we should certainly not suppose that the name was forgotten. The peculiar feature of Jewish practice is that while the name was generally unspoken, it was a frequent subject of ref reference. Later, the rabbis used the word Hashem, meaning the name as a substitute for the divine name. Some Jews still do that. Now, that's also true in the New Testament. For a start, usually when the word kurios, Lord, appears in quotations of the Old Testament, the word stands for the divine name. There are also explicit references to the name, as we shall see. But I want to start with Jesus' own usage in the Gospels. And there's one reference to the divine name in the teaching of Jesus that is very familiar, indeed, Christians. Hallowed be your name is, of course, the first petition of the Lord's Prayer in both the shorter version in Luke and the more familiar longer version in Matthew. Now, I guess that many Christians using the words of this prayer regularly, it does not occur to them that the name to which Jesus referred is the Hebrew personal name that God revealed to Moses. Maybe they take it as simply a metaphorical way of referring to God. May God be honoured and reverenced. Now, it's true that God's name in Scripture can refer to God's reputation. Um, or it can be virtually aware of referring to God himself. Jewish here would imagine that the name itself was not being referred to in this prayer. So. In Old Testament phrases, for example, praise the name of the Lord means praise God, but it refers to God as the one who is identified by his personal name. The name names God's identity. So in the Lord's Prayer, the hallowing of God's name means the reverent acknowledgement of the holy God whose name is the Hebrew word the four letters, the tetragrammaton. Now compare this passage, the prophets, Ezekiel. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations shall know that I am Lord God, 
when through you I display my holiness before their eyes. I will sanctify my great name. That's precisely what Jesus' prayer is asking God to do. Your name be hallowed or sanctified is not some kind of wish that people will, will sanctify God's name. It's a prayer requesting God to sanctify his name, to bring it about that people acknowledge and reference him. It longs for that great act of salvation by which the prophets expected God would himself know. In Jesus' prayer, your name be hallowed stands in parallel to your kingdom come in both versions and in Matthew's version also your will be done. It's a prayer, um, sorry, uh, your will be done. Uh, uh, and, and Matthew's version ends as in heaven, so on earth, which applies to all three of the petitions. In heaven, God's name is already acknowledged, his rule is obeyed, his will is done. We pray for God to bring about the same on earth. All those three aspects of, God, uh, of a proper relationship to God, hallowing his name, his kingdom coming, his will done, all three of those are to happen on earth as in heaven. Well, after all that, it may come as a surprise to find that in the words of Jesus in the Gospels, and leaving aside quotations from the Hebrew Bible, Jesus never refers to God as Lord, the standard substitute for the Tetragrammaton, except in just two anomalous cases where we must attribute the word to the evangelist. Now, this is a remarkably consistent feature of the words of Jesus. And given the frequency of the use of Lord in other Jewish literature, it makes Jesus' usage, so far as I'm aware, highly unusual or even unique. So, if Jesus did not call God Lord, how did he refer to God? One way is the use of what is known as the divine passive. And the easiest way to explain this is to give a few examples. Um, it's a way of speaking that attributes an action to God without directly saying so. So instead of saying God does X, one says, X is done. It's a Jewish way of speaking that we can find in Jewish literature, but Jesus seems to have especially favoured it. Sometimes scholars say that it's a way of avoiding using the divine name, but of course one can easily avoid the divine name by saying God or Lord. What the divine passive does is it protects God's transcendence. It avoids making God directly the subject of an action in this world. But Jesus didn't and couldn't speak of God only by the use of the divine passive. Quite often he simply uses the word God, theos in our Greek gospels. This is a perfectly normal way Jewish way of speaking of God in the Hebrew Bible. God is often in the Hebrew Bible called God, Elohim, though less often than he is called by the divine name. In Jewish literature, there's a tendency to use God more often and the divine name less often. But here we need to remember that Jesus usually spoke Aramaic, not Hebrew. And so far, I've not said anything about how the divine name was treated in Aramaic. Did people speaking Aramaic also say Lord, as one said in Hebrew? Unfortunately, we do not have very much Jewish Aramaic literature from the time of Jesus. 
But it seems that in Aramaic, Jews did not use the term Lord. In Aramaic, that would be Mara as a substitute for the Tetragrammaton. The word Mara or Mari, my Lord, is used of God and in address to God, but it's not substituted for the divine name. For the purpose of substituting for the divine name, Aramaic writers simply use the Aramaic word for God, Elah. It's the Aramaic equivalent of Elohim. So this may in part explain Jesus' usage. For example, take one of the most frequent key terms Jesus uses, the kingdom of God. In Hebrew, one would expect that to be the kingdom of the Lord, using Lord as substitute for the divine name. But Jesus speaking Aramaic says kingdom of God, using God as substitute for the divine name, as one did in Aramaic. Well, I still don't think that sufficiently explains Jesus' non-use of Lord for God. He didn't just use God instead, the word God instead. And now we need to re re remember that alongside the divine passive, what is characteristic of Jesus' usage is the word Father. Now, Jews in this period very occasionally called God Father, but it was rare. Jesus seems to have privileged this word for God. Now, most interesting is the way Jesus addresses God in prayer. According to the Gospels, Jesus always addressed God as Father, with the single exception of his cry from the cross, my God, why have you forsaken me? In which in, he's adopting the words of the psalm in that case. But in every other case, 16 times, not counting parallels in the various Gospels, the Gospels represent Jesus as praying to God as Father. And in addition, there is the prayer he gave to his disciples for their regular use, which begins simply Father in Luke's version. Our Father in heaven, in Matthew's version. This almost exclusive use of Father to address God was certainly unusual. And the New Testament shows that it was regarded as special and distinctive by preserving the actual Aramaic word that Jesus used, Abba. Not only does Mark in his gospel preserve the Aramaic word Abba when he gives us Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane. But also Paul says that Christians pray Abba, Father. That's in Paul's letter written in Greek to the Roman Christians, many of whom did not speak Aramaic. Early Christians must have thought there was something very special about Jesus' use of the word Abba. In, in, in prayer for them to continue to use this word, even in contexts where Aramaic was not the local language. I think this must mean that Jesus used the word Father as his own chosen substitute for the divine name. I've never seen this suggested by anyone else, but it seems to me to make good sense of his usage. Remember, the divine name was given to Israel, especially so that God's people could address him by name, call on the name of the Lord. And whereas, Jesus in Je whereas Jews in Jesus' time standardly addressed God as Lord in Hebrew or in Aramaic as my God or our God, using these names as substitutes for the divine name, Jesus chose instead to use Abba. Father. It's Jesus's substitute for the name. Not, of course, in the sense of replacing the name, but in the sense of referring to the name while not actually speaking it. It is a novel means of reverent reference to the name. 
Now, we could discuss at length why Jesus did this, why he chose the term father. But within the limits of this lecture, I must now move to the use of the divine name by New Testament writers. And New Testament writers, writing, of course, in Greek, use the Greek word kurios, meaning Lord, only occasionally of God, except in Old Testament quotations, where it's the regular substitute for the divine name. Usually, New Testament writers call God either God or Father, with variations such as our Father and Father of Jesus Christ. This might appear to be a continuation of Jesus' usage, but in another respect, their usage is quite different from Jesus's. They do use the word Lord, kurios, frequently, but they use it to refer to Jesus himself. So, for example, Paul, in the opening greetings of his letters, uses the standard formula, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He then regularly continues with a prayer addressed to God, sometimes also described as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We could say the reason Paul does not call God Lord is that he reserves the term for Jesus. So what is going on when Jesus is called Lord? We need to be aware that that Greek word kurios has a wide range of meaning. Basically, it denotes a social superior. It can be no more than a polite mode of address, sir, as it sometimes is in the Gospels when people address Jesus as kurios, sir. It can refer to an owner or employer a master, as for example, the master of a slave. And this is quite a common use in the New Testament where Christians are servants or slaves of Jesus, their Lord or master. The word kurios can also refer to a ruler and therefore to God as sovereign Lord of all things. But as we've seen, kurios was also used by Jews as the regular substitute for the divine name, when it has both the connotation of rule and also the distinctive function of representing God's personal name. This wide range of meaning makes it difficult to be sure when the word as applied to Jesus functions to refer to the divine name, but we can be sure that it does in quite a lot of cases. There are, for example, a considerable number of cases of Old Testament quotations in Paul and other writers of the New Testament. Quotations in which the word Lord in the text representing the divine name is understood to refer to Jesus. And there are also standard phrases adapted from the Old Testament, such as the word of the Lord the day of the Lord, and very significantly, to call on the name of the Lord, where when the New Testament uses those phrases, the Lord is understood to be Jesus. Now, for understanding that usage, here is one key text. And some words about this will be the conclusion of the lecture. Uh, this is a familiar passage, I hope, from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the so-called Christ hymn of that letter. And Paul says, therefore God also highly exalted him, gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now, the first thing to notice about this is that it echoes a passage in Isaiah.
you'll see how explicitly that passage is about the Lord God using the divine name. And at the end, he says, to me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. So in Isaiah, it's God, the one and only God, to whom every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. In Philippians, the same language is applied to Jesus. And the key to that usage lies in the divine name. So there can be no doubt that when Paul says the name that is above every name is given to Jesus, he means the Tetragrammaton, the name revealed to Moses in Exodus 3. Surely this passage depicts that hallowing of God's name for which we pray in the Lord's Prayer. The hope of the prophets for God to sanctify his name in all the world, for all nations to call on the name of the Lord, comes to fulfilment when Jesus is seen to be the revelation of God, and therefore the one who shares the divine name with his father. So in conclusion to the lecture, we see how the revelation of the divine name to Moses was the beginning of a long story of revelation of the name that is yet to reach its end. In giving himself the name, God made himself accessible and approachable and knowable to his people, Israel. But this was not for Israel's sake alone, but with a view to God's revelation of himself to all nations. By giving his name to Jesus, God indicates that it is in Jesus that he makes himself knowable and accessible to all people. God has a personal name that we acknowledge whenever we call Jesus Lord and whenever we pray to the Father for the hallowing of his name. Thank you, Professor, for your stimulating lecture. So, brothers and sisters, uh, we will have the next session, which is uh, the uh, discussion between uh, Professor and we have the responder here, Dr. Uh, Yonki Karman. But uh, prior to that, uh, I would like to provide a Sola Scriptura information. Uh, echo, would you please uh, uh, share the screen of the slides? Uh, Sola Scriptura has uh, several uh, books to promote today, and here we are. Uh, we can have a look for the slide for a while. Uh, please, Echo. Okay, it's coming. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, this is the collection of uh, Sola Scriptura a book uh, in collaboration with Perkanta's uh, Literature. The first book is Virtual Reality Church, uh, Perangkap dan Peruang, uh, Mengeksplorasi Gereja dan Teologi Dalam Suatu Dunia Digital Untuk Merefleksikan Allah Dunia Kehidupan Itu Sendiri Dengan Cara Yang Baru. Uh, you have the contacts there, all right, the WhatsApp number, uh, and also uh, Instagram, Facebook. So uh, don't miss this book. Okay, next slide. Right, the second one. Okay, uh, this one. So uh, the professor's book basically has been translated by Perkantas Literatur, uh, Who is God? And in Bahasa Indonesia is Siapakah Allah Itu? Yeah, the key moments of God's revelation in our Bible, which we are discussing now uh, today, next week, and 7th of January. Please don't miss this book. You can already have it by contacting all the contacts there, a WhatsApp number, a Facebook, Instagram, and also the web there. 
www.literaturperkantas.net. One more time. All right, this book is just recent, just published just now. All right, and this is the Sola Scriptura collection, and we still have the stock. All right, uh, we have uh, the case for the resurrection of Jesus by uh, Professor Michael Licona. Uh, Miracles is a very great book uh, by Professor Craig Keener. Uh, in the middle, uh, the book that is just launched today, uh, written by Professor Richard Bokum, just translated by Perkanta Sitatur. We also have a popular version of uh, Professor Keener's book, which is The Gift and Giver, is a very good book you need to have. And the last one, which we have already presented to you, is Virtual Reality Church by Professor Der Block. Thank you. Now, without further ado, I would like, oh, we have uh, Dr. Yonki Karman. So please, uh, Renato, please uh, uh, share the slide. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Yonki Karman, uh, uh, his profile. All right, thank you. It's already on the screen, brothers and sisters. So uh, Yonki Karman, PhD, is the senior lecturer in Sekolah Tinggi Filsafat Theologi Jakarta. Uh, he earned his PhD from Evangelist Theology Fakultat Leuven, Belgia. Belgia. All right. Uh, he is teaching Hebrew, hermeneutics, uh, Judaism, Old Testament, and biblical theology. And he is ordained at Greja, Greja Christian Satya, Indonesia. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Karman, uh, good evening. Thank you for your time with us. Okay. Uh, have Thank you... you for your introduction. Okay. Yeah, we, we clearly hear you. Very, very, very clear voice. All right, uh, Dr. Yanti Karman, it's your time to have a respond to Professor's lecture. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Professor Richard Bokum, for such a comprehensive presentation of the divine name in the Old Testament and New Testament context that God's people in the New Testament do not need to pronounce the name of the Israelite God. Christians are so called after Jesus' title as the Christ. They are not admirers of the name Yahweh. They are not Yahweh's. This is also my theological position. can see your slide, uh, uh, Dr. Yes. Uh, you can put in slideshow. Yeah. Uh, right. uh, no, 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 no. Uh, slideshow at the top. We, yeah. OK, yeah. Very good. However, a name is a way of revealing one's identity. The divine name then is a way of revealing his identity. It is pretty much clear that Yahweh in the Old Testament is the only saving name, the name to be praised. Here is some quotation from the New Jerusalem Bible. Our help is in the name of Yahweh who made heaven and earth. The name of Yahweh is a strong tower. The upright runs to it and is secure. Yahweh, our God, we invoke your name. The prologue of Decalogue gives the theological and historical basis of Yahweh's exclusivity for the Old Testament people of God. I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, where you live as slaves. You still have no other gods to rival me. You shall not misuse the name of Yahweh, your God. 
based on such biblical texts, a small number of Indonesian Christians, admirers of the name Yahweh, have separated themselves and founded small churches. Some of them just stay in the churches and practice pronouncing the divine name as their personal devotion. Once they file a lawsuit against the Indonesian Bible Society, which was accused of deliberately concealing the divine name to the knowledge of, Christ of Indonesian Christians. Certainly, they have Jude Judaized Christian faith. Since Judaizing Christian faith has been a Christian phenomenon, although insignificant, throughout the church history, we can say that Christian pronouncing of Yahweh is just a kind of Christian devotion. Do you think, Professor Bo Bokum, just using the name Yahweh instead of the Lord is unchristian? Do you consider such practice not as a kind of Christian devotion? Professor, uh, th 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 thank you, Dr. Carmen, very much. Um, that that's very interesting. I I didn't know about that um, Indonesian context of Christians using the name. Could, could I just clarify? Do they use it instead of the name Jesus, or as, as well as the name Jesus? They still use. The name of Jesus, but it is yes. a different person for Yahweh. Yes. Okay. So, so what they're doing is saying they're pronouncing the name where uh, many of us would say Lord or Lord God or something like that. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yes, yes. 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 They do. Yes. Uh, I mean, the, the, the worldwide uh, group that do that, of course, are the Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't know whether these Christians are related to the Jehovah's Witnesses, but the Jehovah's Witnesses in the 19th century started. Um, and of course, they, they said the name as Jehovah, which was the kind of traditional way of, uh, of, of giving vowels to the name um, and called themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, what what I think about this is uh, I think we should, as Christians, follow the practice of Jesus and the apostles, which was certainly not to pronounce the name. I think that's very clear in the New Testament. Um, they use substitutes. I think in Jesus' case, Jesus was innovating the word father as his own substitute for the divine name. So that I think as a matter of fact, we come closest to Jesus usage when we address his father as father or our father or the father of Jesus Christ. When we address God as our father, but we also remember that Jesus, when using that term, was also referring to the divine name. So we haven't forgotten the divine name. We've not stopped using it. But we use it when we call God Father. By implication, we use it when we call God Father, continuing Jesus' usage. And we also use it when we call Jesus Lord, which is continuing Paul's usage and other New Testament writers with reference to Jesus. So. I think the point I want to make is that although Jews uh, refrained from pronouncing the name, they certainly didn't stop referring to it. And in that sense, Christians are continuing to refer to the name. Um, but by using Father, we're referring to the name in a way that introduces Jesus special way of relating to God. Does that answer the question well enough? Uh, what, Carmen, or? Yes. Do, 
Do you want to I can agree with with this. Uh, but let me take my second uh, my second question. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah. Yes, we can have we can see that, uh, Dr. Lam. Okay. Uh, so you you have argued that no one now is absolutely sure of the pronunciation of the divine name, but that fact doesn't forbid Christians from pronouncing the name being pronounced Yehoah or Yahweh. Would God be offended? just because his people mispronounce his name. And by not pronouncing the Old Testament divine name and just declaring the name Jesus, has the name Jesus replaced the name Yahweh? If Yahweh has been now called Father, which is not a traditional way of Jewish designation of the divine name, how can we take Father as the personal name of the Israelite God? Thank you. Um, I, I I don't think I I'm I'm, su I'm not su suggesting actually that Father is the personal name. I'm saying that it's the Christian way of referring to the Hebrew name of God. Um, just as Jews at the time of Jesus used Lord as a way of referring to the Hebrew name. And in Jewish tradition, of course, there have been a variety of ways um, of, of um, of doing that, of a variety of substitutes. Um, I, I, I focused for simplicity on the word Lord, which was the most common, but there were other ways of substituting for the divine name. Certainly when you get to the rabbis, they use the word Hashem, meaning the name. Um, and uh, Josephus uses the Greek word despotes, meaning master, rather than the uh, uh, Greek word kurios. So there are a variety of ways in which in the Jewish tradition uh, they have referred to the divine name without pronouncing it. And I'm suggesting that Father in the tradition that stems from Jesus is another way of referring to the divine name without pronouncing it. And you are saying as if Jesus is referring to the Israel God, not in a Jewish way, but in a, in a Christian way. Well, yes, uh, I mean, I do think it's very remarkable and not many people have really noticed this, but it's very remarkable that Jesus never uses the word Lord for God unless it's an actual quotation from the Hebrew Bible. So that's very peculiar. You know, in, in contrast to most Jews of his time, Jesus doesn't use the word Lord uh, as the substitute for the divine name. Um, uh, he does use the word God, uh, and that's tricky because in Aramaic, in Aramaic, it seems that the word God, Elah, was the substitute. So he does use the word God, but it's also remarkable that Jesus uses the word Father uh, many, many times. I mean, it's overwhelmingly the most common way Jesus refers to God is Father. And almost exclusively when he prays to God, he uses the word Father. Um, and it's in prayer to God. I mean, that, that's the basic um, significance of the divine name, the Hebrew divine name that you use it to call upon God. Jesus uses the word Father to call upon God. And then in the Lord's Prayer, he tells us to say, Our Father, hallowed be thy name. So I think he's closely connecting what is an innovation, but he's closely connecting it with, um, with, the, 
with, with the divine name, the Hebrew divine name. So I don't think he's discarding the Hebrew divine name, but he is saying something fresh. And again, Father wasn't completely unknown in Jewish usage, but Jesus make, Jesus privileges it. And I think if we're going to talk about why he did that, which I didn't do in the lecture, uh, I think he did so because um, his own unique special experience of God was as son of his father. And Jesus, as it were, shared with his disciples that special relationship with God that was his. So the God is the same God who spoke to Moses, but there's something fresh and new about the way Jesus related to him, which we as Christians have uh, derived from Jesus. Thanks for your elaboration. And now uh, I come to my final response. Uh, are pronouncing the name Yahweh, praising the name, and praying to Yahweh theologically incorrect? And why is it wrong, especially since Yahweh is not an obsolete name and it still refers to the living God, especially to the Jews nowadays? Is the way to be a Christian? just not pronouncing the name Yahweh, excluding the name in Christian discourse and devotion. Isn't the marginalization and exclusion of the name a form of replacement theology, not to say a Marcionic way of dealing with the name Yahweh? And finally, is it theologically incorrect for the name Yahweh and the name Jesus to coexist? Thank you, Professor Bokam. Professor Karman, sorry, uh, could you please uh, uh, still sharing your screen so that Professor, uh, you know, is still able to see? And this is a very, these are very great questions, and Professor can answer probably uh, one by one. Yes. Thank you, Professor. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, let me respond to the point about the marginalization and exclusion of the name being a form of replacement theology. Um, I mean, my, my sort of response to replacement theology or um, sometimes called supersessionism um, is uh, something that already does, has rather strongly a, a, a appeared in the Christian tradition, especially in the early centuries and the medieval period. The, the idea, in other words, that the Christian church has replaced Israel as God's people. And Israel, so to speak, uh, is no longer God's people. God has disowned Israel and replaced Israel um, with the uh, Christian church. Now, I, I think we should resist that. And I, I think we should uh, say Paul, you remember, Paul uses the metaphor of the um, uh, of, of the tree um, uh, into which Gentile Christians are grafted. So we are branches grafted into the tree, which is God's people Israel. And the tree doesn't cease to exist. Um, Gentiles share in the inheritance of God's people Israel which is, of course, is why we use the Old Testament, uh, why we reject Marcion's um, uh, uh, negation of the Old Testament. Uh, we insist that our God is the God who revealed himself to Moses and the prophets. Um, so we stand in continuity with the, Jesus, with the Jewish tradition alongside the people of Israel. Um, and it, 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 it's the beginning of what I think in that prophecy of Zechariah uh, was being said, that the Lord will become king over all the earth. The Lord will be one and his name will be one. So this is the inviting of all people into knowledge of the God who revealed himself to Israel. 
um, so that his name will be one, so everyone. Jews, of course, still using it, but everyone else also joining Israel in, in using the name. Um, so I really don't think this is uh, replacement theology. Um, because we continue to use the name, you see, I think it could be something like replacement theology if we said, as, again, as some Christians have said in the past, that the name, the Hebrew name is obsolete. That was just the name for Israel. And we now have the name Father or the Trinitarian name, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, um, instead of the, the, um, the Hebrew name. And I'm saying we don't have those other names in place of the Hebrew name, but they are ways of actually referring to the Hebrew name without pronouncing it. Now, is pronouncing the name theologically incorrect? Well, I, I think I, I do want to say that it, it, in a sense it is, but I, I don't want to say this terribly strongly because if people have good reasons for wanting to use the name itself, pronouncing the name, and disagree with my arguments. Um, they're disagreeing with me. I, I, I don't think, I mean, this has never been defined as doctrine. Um, I, I, I don't want to, you know, uh, I, I, I don't want, want to pronounce, I don't want to talk, call people heretics because they don't agree with my view on this. Um, I think for various reasons, we should not pronounce the name. One of them being that Jesus and the apostles didn't do so. Um, and of course, if they had done so, if Jesus had said the name uh, out loud, um, we would have heard of it. It would have been so scandalous that we would know about it. Um, so we can be sure that he didn't, and nor did the disciples of Jesus or the early church. Um, so I just think we should follow that example. Um, now it can be said that of course, for most of the Old Testament period, people did pronounce the name. And one can see the development of, of, of the non-pronunciation of it happening in the late Old Testament period. Um, so it is something that begins within scripture, I would say. It's not just a sort of post-Old Testament Jewish thing. It does begin within scripture. And that I think, you know, is, is it further helps to legitimate uh, the way Jesus and the apostles uh, spoke. Um, but of course, you, you see, we, we, um, we all use the Psalms, don't we? I mean, Christians have always prayed the Psalms of Israel. Um, and the name Yahweh occurs in the Psalms many, many times constantly. Um, and uh, I think, again, by praying the Psalms and using the substitute Lord, which in English translations is what we find in the in the Psalms in English, I think uh, equivalent in Indonesian, um, we are again doing as Jews do, did, doing exactly as Jews did in, in the time of Jesus. We are referring to the name, but not pronouncing it. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, you do not agree with me. Uh, the name Yahweh and the name the name Jesus uh, is something uh, an unfinished theological agenda mm. for the time being. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we must okay. somewhat disagree there, but we, we, we will both go on thinking about it, I'm sure. All right. Thanks for yeah. your responses. Very, very excellent questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Karman. Uh, thank you for your response. And uh, I think you re represent us in asking the question. So, uh, brothers and sisters, we still have more than 20 minutes. Uh, I just have uh, some uh, information. First is uh, today's lecture, uh, the subtitle, uh, the title of the webinar is Who is God? Uh, for today is the revelation of a divine name, 
Next week is the revelation of divine character. All right, and on the 7th of January will be the revelation of Trinity. So uh, please do not miss all the sessions because this is very important for brothers and sisters, uh, especially uh, for Sunday school teachers, uh, lecturers, and also laymen like me. All right. All right. Um, the second uh, got from the committee is that uh, now we have 20 minutes, but uh, we would like to inform that uh, probably if uh, we still have uh, questions, we will extend until 9.15 p.m. Uh, for, but for those of you uh, who will uh, leave, that would be fine. Uh, it's recorded by the committee and it will be in Sola Scriptura YouTube channel. And uh, probably the third uh, announcement is uh, we have Sola Scriptura Indonesia YouTube channel. You can uh, see our videos, uh, many webinars and many seminars uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, very, very good materials. So please uh, visit and subscribe our Sola Scriptura Indonesia uh, YouTube channel. All right. Professor, questions from the floor here. Question number one. Dear Professor Balkan, thanks a lot for this lesson. I have a question. Many theologians said that, uh, that Jesus said in the gospel, uh, if I'm mistaken, in the gospel of John, uh, refers to Ehieh Asher Ehieh. Do you agree with uh, this argument? Could you explain grammatically and theologically how can it be? Probably one of them is like uh, before Abraham was, I am or something like that. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a good question um, because it has very often been thought that those words I am uh, in, when Jesus uses them in that sort of absolute sense you know he, he also says I am the good shepherd I am the gate and those kind of things but when he says I am as, a, as an absolute statement um, that has often been taken to be uh, as it were the translation of the divine name in Exodus um, depending on that the, the the words that God says this is before revealing the name you remember are I will be has sent me to you, uh, but you could also translate it, I am has sent me to you. Um, I, uh, let me first of all say that if that's correct, if, if that's what Jesus means, of course it is a reference to the divine name. It's not the actual divine name itself. So Jesus would not be speaking the divine name. He would be using a way of referring to it by a sort of paraphrase of it, I am. Um, but I actually don't think that's the right explanation of what Jesus is doing. I think Jesus is taking up uh, the phrase that is used in, it's used once at the end of Deuteronomy, and it's used um, a considerable number of times in Isaiah 40, the chapters following Isaiah 40. Um, and it's usually translated in English by the phrase, I am he. So it's God who declares, I am he. And in the context, it's very much a declaration of God's uniqueness um, over against the idols and the other gods. Um, so, um, uh, and the Hebrew in, in Isaiah is anihu, I, he, but it's a way of saying, I am he. Um, ego eimi in Greek, which Jesus used, is, is also uh, of a perfectly good way of saying I am he. Um, so I think that's that's the illusion. No, it's 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 no less a declaration of Jesus' divinity than if you take it as referring to Exodus 3. Um, it's, um, it's actually a peculiarly monotheistic way of asserting God's divinity. That, that's what God is doing by saying I am he in, in Isaiah. All right, next question. This is in Indonesian. Uh, I'll try my best uh, to translate. If God has introduced 
her, his name to the Israelites with the name Yahweh, then why Jesus still called God uh, with the word Abba, Abba or Abba? And uh, why didn't he call his name as his name before? Uh, what does it mean uh, that Jesus uh, used, you know, uh, the word Eba? And probably in relation to our quick survey professor, please answer whether it is Swedish, Aramaic, Syriac, Greek, or <laughs> Hebrew. Please, professor. Yes, Swedish, of course, was a joke, but <laughs> in case people don't know, it, it's, it's a famous pop group, uh, Swedish pop group called ABBA, but it's, oh, pure, okay. it, 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 it's, it's pure coincidence. I mean, there's no connection there, but I, <laughs> sometimes if you say ABBA to people who have no idea of the theological context, they, they think of this Swedish pop group. That, that's why I said it. However, um, to be serious, um, um, uh, well, I, I have to just kind of repeat what I said, really, which is that by the time of Jesus, nobody pronounced the divine name, the Hebrew divine name. Instead, they used substitutes for it. And they were substitutes, not in the sense of replacing, but in the sense of referring to the name. I wish I could think of a better word than substitute in English, actually, but... Um, so the substitute is a way of referring to the name uh, without using it. So if you use the substitute, you should have the divine name in mind. And God, of course, knows that you're using a substitute. So you are referring to the name, but you're not pronouncing it out of reverence. So it's a kind of reverence for the fact that the divine name is, is kind of unique and uh, no other name is like it. So let's not say it, but let's just refer to it. Um, so there were various substitutes. The most popular one was Lord, which Jesus never uses. Um, uh, but I'm suggesting that when Jesus used the word Father, that was Jesus's own substitute for the divine name. And I think you can see that really rather clearly in the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus tells us to say, Our Father who is in heaven, your name be hallowed. So he's the Father and the name, which is the Hebrew divine name, to be hallowed. Thank you. So probably a quick question for me, uh, Professor. So before uh, Peter met Jesus, how uh, did he pray? Did he say, Lord? Um, be before people met him, you said? Peter, Peter met Jesus, oh, let's oh, say. Oh, before Peter. Um, uh, I well, I, I think that Jesus always prayed to God as Father. Um, uh, do, do you remember the, the story in Luke of Jesus of his parents taking Jesus up to Jerusalem when he was twelve? Yep. And and they worry about him and so on. And he he says something like, "Should should I be about my father's business?" So it kind of um, indicates that already. Jesus went, um, ha, ha, had a quality that um, led him to use the word father for that. So I think that um, as far as we could know, of course, you know, we don't we can't get inside the mind of Jesus. We only have the Gospels. Um, as far as we know, that would have been Jesus' dominant way of praying to God. Um, now, of course, he could have used, uh, 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 I mean, it's quite, uh, he, he could have used other ways alongside it. I'm not suggesting he never addressed God in any other way. Um, uh, uh, in, in fact, um, I mean, there's one saying in the Gospels where he refers to, uh, no, no I, I, I've lost it, I'm sorry, but, um, but, but I'm saying that, you know, Father was the word that for Jesus expressed his special experience of God as his father. Okay, next question. Professor Bochum, given 
the importance of God's name, to which you have given a lecture. What advice would you give to Bible translators to faithfully and uh, with full responsibility translate Yahweh into any languages? Thank you. Yes, I mean, I think the practice, which goes back a long way, uh, of translating in English, translating or uh, of using in with, using in place of the divine name, the word Lord, um, but distinguishing it from the ordinary use of Lord by putting the letters in uppercase, capital letters. Um, so if you read the English Old Testament and you know what's going on, you know that when Lord appears in capital letters, it's a substitute for the divine name. When it appears otherwise, it's the word Lord, and the, it's, the, it's the Hebrew word for Lord, not the divine name. Um, now, uh, what is important, I think, is I, I think we should all do this really as teachers and, uh, and so on and in relation to other Christians. We should just make people aware of that practice in the translation of the Old Testament. I mean, I, mean, I find lots of Christians just don't understand that. Uh, and we do need to put the message across that if that's what your translation says, um, Lord in capital letters or equivalent in whatever yeah. other language is being used, uh, that means that's where the divine name occurred. Now, the only English translation I know that spells out the divine name uh, with the, you know, the, the, the vowels supplied is the old Jerusalem Bible. But I think it's rather significant that actually the translators of the Jerusalem Bible realized that it wasn't a very good idea and new editions of the Jerusalem Bible don't do it. They've gone back to the old English, the usual English practice of putting the Lord in capital letters rather than spelling out the divine name. Now, there's one other way you can do this, and I do this if I'm writing a, if I'm writing a, a scholarly article. Um, I, I, I use the four letters, Y-H-W-H in English, uh, put them in capitals, and just use those four consonants as the divine name. And of course, if you see that, you know perfectly well it is the divine name, but it doesn't invite you to pronounce the name because it uses only the consonants, the way the Hebrew text does. I, I'm not sure whether that would be a suitable way of translating in, in, in actual Bible translations. But I, I do think translators, whatever they do, and I, whether they do that or, or use a substitute, I mean, they, they just ought to make it very clear in introducing the translation that, that that's what is happening so that um, readers should know where the divine name actually does occur in the text. Thank you. Uh, that question was from uh, ba 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 the, uh, sorry, from ba Andreas. Now from Pak Ferdian Suawa, uh, it's in Indonesian, uh, try to translate in English, is the tetragrammaton used as a proper name? Uh, can tetragrammaton uh, be replaced uh, with other names? With other names? Um... No, I, I mean, I think that the, the Tetragrammaton is the only personal name of God in the, in the Hebrew Bible. I mean, of course, there are various other uh, titles of God, like Lord of Hosts and uh, um, uh, 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 the Most High. That's quite common. Uh, or just, just God, of course, Elohim. Um, there are a variety of ways of referring to God, um, but I think the Hebrew name, the Tetragrammaton, is the only one that you could say is a personal name. Um, uh, be because, you know, uh, you, you, can, you can find it in the Old Testament, as it were, contrasted with the personal names of, uh, of pagan gods. 
Um, so I think it does, it is a personal name. Um, and whereas in the case of the Most High or the, the Lord of Hosts, the meaning of the title is important. I think in the case of the Tetragrammaton, it's not the meaning that is important. Um, the Hebrew Bible actually never, hardly ever, if, if ever, refers to the meaning of the, of the, of the name. But it's important just because it's a name which identifies God. Um, just as my name, Richard, which does mean something, but most English people have no idea what it means, um, <laughs> it actually functions as an, an, an identity marker. It, it names me so that if you say Richard or if you say Richard Borkham, um, it, it's a way of naming my identity. So I think the tetragrammaton is a way of naming God's identity. Next question, Anonymous. Hello, Professor Bokum. What a wonderful lecture you have given on the divine name. I want to ask a question about the option for future I will be. Uh, instead of the more popular I am in the present mood. I just look up in Septuagint that the translators were using the present mood, ego, I, me, or on, instead of the future. I don't know, I do not know Hebrew, but Koine, <coughs> I think uh, he knows, he or she knows Koine Greek. Is the translation of the Septuagint suggest, does the translation of the Septuagint suggest that the Hebrews would refer to the present mood I am instead of the future I will be? Or are there any reasons why biblical scholars prefer uh, preferring the future one? Thank you. Yes, I mean, that is interesting. And I, I think the, the Septuagint translation, um, which of course is, is actually not a, it's not a, um, uh, it's not a literal translation at all because it doesn't say I am ego eimi. What it says is ha own, which means the one who is. Um, so actually, it's kind of um, I think it's kind of avoiding the grammatical awkwardness of using a verb I am as a name. I I am has sent me to you. Um, so it translates it as a. Uh, it's a participle, really, the one who is. Um, uh, uh, but the, that translation, I think, has probably influenced a lot of the Christian tradition and explains why that most of the time people have thought um, that the name means who is. Now, actually, in the book of Revelation, you might remember this or you might not, but in the book of Revelation, one of the ways in which um, the prophet refers to God is to call him the one who is and was and is to come. Yeah. So it's yeah. actually spelling out God's existence in three tenses, past, present and future. Um, actually, the, the order varies in different parts of the book for, for, per, for particular reasons, but you know, it, can, it can be who was and is and is to come, or is and was and is to come. Um, so I think what's happening, and there are some Jewish parallels to that, actually. And I think what's happening there is that they are, in a way, they're recognizing that it's perfectly accurate to translate the word ehye in Exodus 3 as I am or as I will be. I mean, they're both, they're both correct translations. Um, and, and so you could spell it out like that. Um, my preference for I will be as the sort of primary meaning in the context is simply that in the context, God is talking about, as it were, what he is going to be for the people of Israel and Moses. It's all about, I am the God who is going to deliver you from Egypt and make you my people. So the whole context is future. And what, Mo what Moses needs to know is what God is going to be, who God will be. And actually, God has, just before saying that, God has said to Moses, I will be with you. And I think uh, I am with you is possible, but I, I will be with you makes much more sense, really, in the context. So it's because 
the, 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 the words are in that context of looking forward to God's promise of what he's going to be for the people of Israel, that I think the future is more appropriate there. Thank you. Next question from, oh, sorry, I just want to inform, it's already 9 uh, p.m., uh, minute uh, past uh, 9 p.m., uh, brothers and sisters, for those of you who still want to be with us, that would be fine. Professor will still be here answering the question, the rest of the questions uh, for another 15 minutes. But for those of you, especially in the uh, eastern part of Indonesia, or probably central part of Indonesia, uh, we know uh, that it's getting late there. Uh, see you next week, right, on the revelation of divine character. So that's the message from the chairman of Scola Scriptura. Thank you. Now, next question for Bapak Taswin Karnadi. From your elaboration, could we conclude that you are referring to a personal God and not as you alternatively describe as the infinite mystery, a term that most of us could be comfortable with? Are not the words uh, suggesting uh, to have been said by the Lord simply uh, been placed in his mouth by the writers of the biblical uh, books. Okay. Um, well, the, the reason I say that God is the infinite mystery is really because uh, we, we, we can't imagine that we could possibly know God fully. Um, he wouldn't be God if we could. So God is the infinite mystery um, and actually just reflecting on the, the idea of God can tell you that. Um, but the Jewish and Christian God is the God who wants to relate to us. He wants us to be in communication and relationship with him. And he wants us to see him at work in the world and in our lives. So he wants us, in that sense, to know him, to know him sufficiently, uh, to know him as, as, as much as finite creatures like us can know him, to know him in such a way as to be able to relate to him. And therefore, I think God reveals himself. God identifies himself for us, is a phrase I quite like to use. God, as it were, gives himself the identity um of the god who brought israel out of egypt the god who is the father of jesus christ the god who raised jesus christ from the dead the god who is father son uh, uh, and spirit as i will say in my third lecture um so we can only know god if he reveals himself if he as it were enters our frame of reference and gives us ways of knowing and relating to him and that's what i did think think god did in his uh, revelation of himself to moses on mount sinai it's what he did when he became incarnate as the man jesus christ um so yeah that that, that that's my answer but it, it, it is that you know the jewish christian god is the personal god who reveals himself and we can only know him that way through revelation next question still anonymous uh, when jesus teaches us to pray hallowed be thy name does thy name refer to god's name only or to god's person himself well you uh, already addressed it in your lecture as we Easterners usually think that name is inseparable from the person itself. Mm. Okay. Yes, uh, I mean, I think I said that a name is what identifies you. A name identifies someone as that person. So you could call me a human being, but if you want to refer to me as particularly me, the, the person I am, you have to call me Richard Borkham. Um, and it's the same with, same with God. So 
Hello V, your name is a way of asking for God's personal identity, really, um, to be revered and, uh, and, and kept holy on earth. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, I mean, I think uh, I think I, I, I agree with what you said is the Eastern view. I agree that a, a, a name is uh, is what names our identity. It's how you how you know how you refer to someone's identity as a person is to use the name. Right. Okay, Professor Balkam, uh, it's from Anonymous. Thank you for your eye-opening explanation on uh, the divine name. My question is about, again, Yahweh, uh, God's uh, proper name. I wonder why the Lord had to wait until he called Moshe, Moses in the burning bush uh, with his, and he experienced, Moses experienced. Then God revealed his proper name. Why not revealing his name ever since the first time the Lord appeared to Abraham? Is there any specific reason for God to do this? Has it, mm. has, does it anything to do with the theological concept of Exodus? Thank you one more time. Mm. Yes, I, I think, it, of course, it does have to do with the Exodus. And, and, and what God is doing in the Exodus is he is choosing the people of Israel to be his own special people. And he goes on to do that at Sinai, of course. Um, and it, I think I think the giving of the name is connected with um, the creation of the people of Israel as God's people, um, because the key thing about the name is that Israel can use it to call on God. It gives them, as it were, access to God, um, and it's given therefore to Israel as God's special people who have special access. It's connected, if you like, with the tabernacle and with the temple. God is present in the midst of his people and therefore he's accessible. Um, so you call him by name. Um, and uh, but, but that um, but the people of Israel, of course, were uh, intended by God to lead the way towards the day when all the nations will be God's peoples, and then the name will be um, uh, recognized and shared by all, all people who will all worship God. That's the Old Testament's uh, future perspective on, on, on things. So I think the giving of the name has reference, it has, um, it, it's connected with the creation of God's own people, Israel. The, pra the patriarchs are the ancestors but for them it's all promise of the the the, the, you know, the, the, the people who are to come uh, as their descendants and so god god relates to the patriarchs in a different way i mean it very, i can't go on about it here but it, it's very interesting if you look at the way god relates to the patriarchs in genesis it is really very different uh, he relates in a kind of an intimate way um there's no temple. There's no sac well. There are a few sacrifices, but there's no there's no temple. There's the, the you know there are lots of places that are consecrated to uh, to God because He's appeared to people there. Um, it's all rather different with the patriarchs, and so there, there is a kind of new stage in God's revelation of Himself to the world. A new stage that occurs uh, at the Exodus, I think. Okay, it's probably one questions we are coming to the end uh, uh, this is from uh, anonymous so the question is so who is god exactly if all used i mean all the names used are just references or yeah you say re the re references right you, you you prefer to say the reference the, to refer right instead of to start with it Oh, well, I mean, that, that's a good plug for my next lecture, because ah. my, my next lecture is about the character of God. Okay. Um, uh, uh, of course, I mean, Revelation wouldn't mean anything if it was just names, um, just as 
calling me Richard Balkum wouldn't mean anything unless you knew me and knew all sorts of things about me. Um, if I were just a name in the telephone directory, you know, you wouldn't be said to know me. Um, so the point of a name is to identify the person who you can then say all sorts of things about. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about next time, the character of God as revealed in the Bible. All right. Okay, uh, probably this one. Uh, can we uh, call other personnel of the Trinity? Probably we will come to the next year uh, about the Trinity, but uh, this is the early question. Can we call the other uh, persons of Trinity uh, with the, the word uh, Father? Oh, um, well, 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 no, because, um, uh, uh, of course, I mean, far, well, certainly that's not the New Testament practice. The, the New Testament practice is for Father to be the, the, the to be God the Father, uh, and of course that, that that derives from Jesus' own use of the word Father to refer to his God and Father. So Jesus is not the Father. The yeah. Father is. The person Jesus relates to as father. Um, so if, if the root of understanding the Trinity is to see that the relationship between Jesus and his father is internal to God, um, that means that Jesus is the son, not the father, and the father is the father, and the spirit is, is never given the term father. Um, so I, th I think um, uh, and and the terms you see relate to the the ways that we relate to the persons of the Trinity. Um, we relate to God the Father as as the as as God who has authority and care and, and loving care. I would say those are the connotations of the word Father: authority and loving care. We relate to Jesus the Son as God who comes alongside us as our human brother. And we relate, we relate to the Spirit as God who is the power within us, transforming us from within. So it wouldn't be appropriate to use the word Father for the Son or the Spirit any more than it's appropriate to use the word Son for the Father and the Spirit. Right. Last question, Professor. So, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, where is it? Uh, uh, the questioner uh, intends to relate to Indonesian context, uh, but uh, the question is, uh, why do we still use the word in Indonesia? Uh, we use the word Allah, Professor. So the question is, why do we still use the word Allah in our Bible, Indonesian Bible? Why not? Why don't we use Elohim or Adonai? As uh, when I read uh, that God personally is God of Moon at that time, all right. <laughs> uh yeah I, I i i mean i i don't really know the context i i have heard that that use of allah by christians is controversial um i mean that there are muslims who object to it i, I believe isn't that right in singapore at any rate um Malaysia. but well my understanding of it is that allah is simply the arabic word for god um and of course it's it's related to elohim they're both semitic languages and Allah is the equivalent in Arabic of the Hebrew word Elohim or the Aramaic word Elah. You see in the book of Daniel, where the chapter is written in Aramaic, God is called Elah, which is virtually the same word as Allah in Arabic. Um, but why the translators in Indonesian chose that term, I, you will have to ask uh, Indonesian experts like Karl and Yosefat. All right. Okay.
Well, thank you, Professor, for your very stimulating uh, first session, uh, the revelation of the divine name. And brothers and sisters, please uh, do not miss next week. Still Christmas. Uh, I know you are you 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 guys are busy with Christmas, but uh, please be with us, Sola Scriptura, with the revelation of divine character. All right, we have come to an end, and I would like to kindly request Dr. Arman Barus to lead us on the closing prayer. Well, thank you. Uh, please, uh, uh, yeah. thank you, Pak Arman. Uh, Pak Arman. Pak Arman Barus. Terima kasih, Pak. Mari kita berdoa. Bapa Maha Kasih dalam Kristus, terima kasih Tuhan untuk diskusi kami dan percakapan kami pada malam hari ini. Kami mohon Tuhan terus memberikan hikmat pengertian kepada Profesor Richard Bogum dan kami semua pada minggu depan akan juga mengikutinya sehingga kami mendapat pengertian pemahaman yang lebih jelas, lebih bening, lebih mengerti akan apa yang dibicarakan oleh uh, Profesor Richard Bokem. Terima kasih ya Bapak. Dan kami akan berpisah dan berserahat. Kami berdoa malam hari ini penyertaan Tuhan menyertai bersama dengan kami. Dalam nama Tuhan Yesus Kristus kami sampaikan doa kami. Amin. Amin. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. See you next week. Uh, be with, uh, be right back with you, and enjoy your Christmas time. Merry Christmas. <laughs>